All right, so what we have here, I'm gonna let these guys go ahead and introduce themselves because I was not prepared for this. I just kind of stepped in, so we will let them introduce themselves. If you guys would like to say your name and then more or less kind of like what you're, what you're famous for, for Disney or your roles or you know that sort of thing, just kind of give a little introduction about yourself if you guys would like, okay? And uh, we'll have to share some of the mics. I've got a couple down here for you guys. So we're introducing ourselves because she doesn't know who the hell we are. <laughs> she tried to cover it, but... Uh, so I'm Rick Farmelo. Um, what I'm known for is basically animating. I'm an animator, Disney animator. I worked on, um, among other things, Little Mermaid, Beauty and the Beast, Aladdin. Um, I did Scuttle, the character Scuttle. And, uh, Little Mermaid, I did Abu, and Aladdin, I did LeFou and Beauty and the Beast. And so that's basically what I'm known for is being an an a Disney animator. So next. <laughs> Uh, there we go, that's much better. I'm a voice actor, I'm Bill Farmer, and I'm an announcer. And uh, I'm best known, I guess, is the voice behind Goofy and Pluto and Horse Horse Collar and some of the uh, Warner Brothers characters over the years and, and uh, various incidental characters. So if it's a voice, it's probably something I've done something about. Anyway, <laughs> that's it, voice acting. I'm Bob Joles, and I'm not sure why I'm here, actually. Uh, I'm Bill Green on Big City Greens. I have done Bagheera for Jungle Book 2. Um, I'm Sneezy of the Seven Dwarves, mm -hmm. and uh, various other sundry voices. If you ride the train at Disneyland, I'm the voice of the conductor, and if you go on the Indiana Jones ride, I replace John Reese Davies' voice in the safety spiel. But it's still John in the ride, so I have no fear. Voice actor. Hi everybody, uh, my name is Daniel Ross. I am a voice actor. Uh, you may know me as one of the voices of Donald Duck, uh, and most recently, uh, Grimace from McDonald's. <laughs> and Stripe Baby! <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I'm here to talk to all of you, and I hope we have an amazing time. Hello, everybody. My name is Mary Gibbs. I was the voice of Boo in Monsters, Inc. And also Baby Riley in Inside Out. Yeah! 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 Puberty happened, so it sounds a little different now. <laughs> anyway, yeah, Hi, uh, I'm Blaine Weaver. I'm the voice of Peter Pan in Return to Neverland on. Um, and that's what you know me for. <laughs> Which one do we use? Hello, my name is Irene Bedard. Um, my very first film was a live action film, A Squanto Over Warrior's Tale, which was a Disney movie. Um, and I'm the voice of Disney's Pocahontas, the speaking voice. And um, got to, to do the reprisal for Ralph Brinks' the internet as well, so that was a lot of fun. Um, <laughs> all of you guys here. I hope you guys are excited to be here in yeah, uh, Burbank, yes. yeah. you know, the uh, current home of the Walt Disney Company down the street, obviously, animation. <laughs> um, I think I will go ahead and just ask you guys one question and then we'll open it up because I'm sure you guys, there's a lot of you guys and there's a, probably a lot of questions out here. What everyone always wants to know, how did you guys get into acting, voice acting, animation? What was your background, your history? What, what drew you towards the film industry? Um, to give you the really short answer, I saw Pinocchio when I was like five years old at the drive-in. Where was the drive-in? And I just was fascinated by what that was. And I wasn't even sure what the hell that was like. It's, and a, it's stuff moving around, but it's, it's a lot different than the stuff I'd seen on TV. So I just, it was magical to me. And, and because of that movie, I just wanted to do that. I didn't know what it was called. I don't know how I was going to do it, but I just always wanted to be an animator, and specifically more for Disney. Um, and so, you know, from the time I was a kid, I used to draw my school papers and draw little monsters all over my, I'd get a C in the math test, and then my teacher would cross out all the drawings I did, 
like pay attention kind of thing. But so my, anything, everything I did was geared towards being an animator someday. So that's kind of the short answer, but that was it's something that started really young in my life. Yeah, there is no real <laughs> uh, set path to becoming a voice actor or getting in any job in Hollywood. Everybody's uh, voyage is a little bit different. Mine, I grew up in a little town in South Central Kansas and was just one of those kids who was enamored with animation and movies when I was a kid, and I would start playing, practicing the voices on, uh, so in the old days it would be like Captain Crunch and so, oh, hold on, ladies, you know, and I'd practice the voice and run around the house, and then I would start doing these things in front of my parents and dinner, and I'd come and see an old John Wayne movie, and hold well, on, let's have ourselves some green beans and put them in a circle, and my dad would look at me and say, there's something wrong with him. And uh, it turned into a career, actually. After college, my degree was in broadcast journalism. I kicked around radio for a number of years as an engineer, as well as an on-air personality. Then in 1982, got into stand-up comedy, which I thought was the best training ground that I've ever had for what I'm doing now. Did that across the country in comedy clubs until 1986, moved to California. And uh, about five months later, was able to get uh, was able to get an agent right away. And about five months later, said, "Do you do any of the Disney characters?" Goofy was my favorite Disney character at the time. And out of about a thousand people, or however many tried out for this thing, uh, they like mine. And uh, they do not hire you. Uh, a lot of people think, you know, here's your lifetime contract with Disney. You're now the voice of Goofy forever. No, it was for one job. And you don't really, you hope you get a second job. I did get a second job and a third and a fourth, and now 36 years later, I'm still doing it. So that's kind of really a short answer of that. I got into voice acting by being a tuba player. I was a professional musician for the first half of my life as an adult. I worked at Epcot when it first opened, playing in the brass quintet, um, and slowly got into voiceover uh, in Orlando. Someone took me under their wing and showed me the ropes, and when I had enough of Orlando after 11 years in purgatory, I decided to come back to Southern California, and uh, was able to get an agent uh, right away, like Mr. Farmer did. And a year after I signed with Don Pitt's Voices, they were having auditions for Snow White on Ice, and that's where I got the voice of Sneezy. And it, one thing led to another, and it just keeps going from there. That was how I got into it. So learn to play the tuba, and you can do what I do. <laughs> oh boy. Uh, so the very first movie I ever saw in theaters was 1986, The Transformers, the movie. And I don't know what it was, going to a movie theater and being transported to a place and seeing things I may never see, feel things I may never feel, that to me was magic. And so uh, my one escape in high school and college was the performing arts, and I loved theater, I studied Shakespeare, I did all of those things and started making my own uh, films. I started with ninjas versus zombies, ninjas versus vampires, and ninjas versus monsters. And I moved to California and said, I, I think I want to be a voice actor because I kept getting in lots of trouble doing prank phone calls and other things uh -oh. and annoying my parents to no end. And so I uh, came out here to see if I could make something happen, and uh, Donald Duck was one of the first characters uh, that I booked, along with Lucky the Leprechaun, who's magically delicious. <laughs> and so I'm just here and grateful to be on the stage with this amazing group of people. I need to pitch myself sometimes, so thank you all for having me. Oh, let's see. <clears throat> well, I'm, I'm sort of famous for Tinkerbell. That's me and uh, a few other things. But to, how I got started was uh, I was born in 1929. That's a long time ago. I turned 94. I've been in show business since I'm four. And it was I caused the depression. <laughs> <laughs> you laugh, but it happened. You went right downhill from there. So uh, unfortunately, I was in a family. My mother passed away. And they were adopting people out. That's what you did. And there were two nice people who were old enough to be my grandparents who, who had no idea what to do with me, but there I was. 
except my mother got the idea because it was so hard to make a living for people that she's as cute as a button, let's put her on the screen. We're gonna get her into show business. So she started teaching me and, and training me and I went to dancing lessons and all the rest. She got me in central casting and the first movie that I ever did, I played a fairy in Midsummer Night's Dream. They're still showing it, as a matter of fact, which I think in our game comedies, anybody see our game comedies? Well, you're looking at one of the last people that, that worked in it, had a wonderful time, uh, tap dancing and all the other things, and then I realized that I really love to entertain people just like you. That's what we have to do. We love to entertain people. I mean, we'll stand on the corner and entertain people. It's part of it. And although my mother was a Hollywood mother, she was just a, an annoying little mother that drove you nuts, but she wanted me to be somebody. So she kept going and kept going. And I worked with Elizabeth Taylor, I worked with MGM, I did many pictures there, and so on and so forth. And I'm at, uh, at Fox doing another, but I'm getting into television. I loved television, much more than motion pictures. But I'm at Fox and I get this call that says, um, they're interviewing for a three and a half inch Sprite who doesn't talk. And can you get off work tomorrow? I was assistant dance director. And I said, oh, gee, you know, yes, I can. She says, it's Disney. I said, I'll be there at 6 a.m. <laughs> <laughs> and so I interviewed with the wonderful man who brought you uh, Tinkerbell and the Darling family and all the wonderful women, uh, at, at all the Disney movies, Mark Davis, who said, uh, when I asked him, what do you want it to be? Do you want it to be ditzy like Betty Boo? Do you want it to be above it all like, uh, let's say, the Queen of the Fairies? He said, Margaret, we want it to be you. And I said, gosh golly, I think I could do that. <laughs> and so that's how I got in with this wonderful group at Disney. And that's how I, and I did lots of radio and all the other things that you did at that time. But I love show business. I've been in it 90 years now. and. Uh, as I say, I would stop on the sidewalk if somebody has an entertainment. And it's just in you or it isn't, right? All right, so I, uh, I got into voice acting uh, because of my dad. So he worked at Disney and Pixar as a storyboard artist for over 30 years. And his first movie um, with Disney was actually Pocahontas, which is kind of cool. Um, and then he went over to Pixar, and he was one of the storyboards on Monsters, Inc. And for those of you who don't know, storyboard artists, they work at the earlier, really earlier stages of the movie. So originally, they weren't even thinking about voice actors. They just needed a little girl to draw. And my dad was in the right meeting at the right time. And he's like, oh, I have a two and a half year old. Let me bring her in. Um, my mom got to give her a shout out. She's in the back in the pink shirt over there. Uh, <laughs> uh, she, should, she deserves the credit in the movie as well. Uh, Sorry, that's my dog. Um, but she, my mom would put my hair in pigtails and I would play around the studio. And that's why Boo has pigtails. So they were, again, they were just sketching me, a little girl with pigtails playing around the studio. And then as the movie progressed, um, you know, normally they have, often they have um, actual, like adults be kids' voices because they could actually direct them. But it was my dad's studio. I was familiar with the environment. I went to preschool with the director's son. So to me, it was just like hanging out with people that I knew. So. But then they um, decided to bring me to the actual recording studio. They're like, well, if we want to use her voice, let's see how she does in an actual recording studio. My mom thought I was going to freeze up. You know, I'm not a trained actress by any, any means. Um, but apparently I walked in like I owned the place. And uh, they, from two and a half to five years old, they followed me around with a microphone. Uh, they couldn't get me to sit still, so you know, I was just playing around the studio. So for me, I mean, it was, you know, I was just playing. I didn't even know what I was doing until I grew up, like, got a little older. But um, yeah, just right meeting at the right time um, for me. So that was that was my end. And then, yeah, then they reused my voice for Baby Riley. So I didn't have to go in and record. That was all booze recordings. Um, so yeah, I was uh, just got luck of the draw for me. And thanks, thanks to my dad. So. Mine is uh, completely 
completely random piece of luck. Uh, I've been in LA uh, acting since I was 18, and you know, commercials and guest stars and you know, uh, whatever parts I could get. And what we used to do pre-COVID is we'd go and show up at our agent's office and just kind of like uh, say, hey, how, remember me? You know, that kind of thing. And uh, so I went into the office to kind of hassle my agent and be like, why haven't I had the audition that's gonna break me yet? And um, she just, my agent looked at her desk and said, uh, here, go down the hall and audition for this at the voiceover department. I'd never done a voiceover. I'd never had an audition for the voiceover. But I went over there and they were looking for um, a voice match uh, for the character of Cubby, who's one of the uh, Lost Boys, who uh, in the original movie was an adult voice that sounded a lot like Goofy to me. I'm just saying. Um, and uh, I can't really do that. I tip my hat to you. But I'm like, I had seen Peter Pan so many times. It was my favorite movie growing up. And I'm like, well, I can't do this, but I could do Peter. Have you cast that yet? And they're like, no, whatever. Just do it and get out of here. Uh, so I did it and I left and I'm like, well, that was random. And about six weeks later, the voiceover department at my agency calls me and says, do we represent you? How, how did you go on tape up for this? And I'm like, oh, well, my agent you know, pushed me off on you. Uh, but you don't, I'm in the theatrical department. And uh, they're like, well, Disney wants to see you. So uh, I ended up booking the first voiceover I ever went out for. And it's pretty much been the only voiceover. I've, <laughs> I've continued in the uh, straight acting kind of world, but it's uh, the only one. And I love it. It's such a great part, and I get to hang out with her and uh, all of these iconic people, and uh, I'm just lucky to be here. Well, um, I'm in Yupiak, in Yupik. Um, I was born in Anchorage, Alaska. My mother is from the village of Quik, so I'm going way back here. It's what we do as, as indigenous people. We, we recognize her. Um, that we are the love of a thousand ancestors, as Maya Angelou says. Anyway, and my father got stationed up in Alaska and he was Métis Cree. So it wasn't even in my real house of thought. I went, my entire family is military, um, and I went to school for physics, and you know, science, math, you know. I was really, uh, physics and philosophy, I was really, really, um, okay at math, basically, and I loved, loved thinking about the universe. But I had always, as the oldest child and the oldest grandchild, uh, started writing plays when I was 10. Start, I was, you know, it was a way to keep track of all my cousins and little brothers and sisters. And, and, um, and then, and was really shy, but I would, you know, go and do plays because I could be someone else. and. And it was a different experience and a different thought process to think about why this person would do whatever it was that they were doing or why they would say what they were saying to this person um, and the experiences that they had or the century they lived in or the decade they lived in and um, or the fantasy that it was. You know, all those things were, were really um, in, in part of my culture as storytellers that's, you know, very much part of how we grew up was not so much um, uh, being reprimanded, but being told stories about why this matters, you know? And so um, I went to the University of the Arts and thought I would start a Native American theater ensemble. And so I moved to New York City and worked with other um, indigenous people there. And my agent came to see the play and signed me on and three months later I was working on my first movie. It wasn't even in my wheelhouse of thought that Hollywood would want an Inupiaq girl from Alaska. So that's why I went all the way back there. <laughs> so, and then I've been working now for 30 years in film and television and animation and I love doing animation. So it's, it's like getting to be a good kid. <laughs> discovered at two and a half by an agent. I was coloring on the floor of his vocals coach. And um, I worked until I was 20. Um, I was a working actress. I did 34 movies and a couple hundred TV shows and it was the golden age of television. It was a very exciting time, especially for 
live television. Live television was wonderful because you had to know your lines, you had to go to your mark, you had to do everything professionally just like the adults. Couldn't goof off, you had to do your job. And uh, I went on interviews all the time and uh, Disney called up and they wanted to see a bunch of kids that could do a little British accent and to play puppies. And so I was one of five kids chosen and I was lucky, I got to be lucky. <laughs> So we are about halfway through the time, so we have some time for some questions. Just keep in mind we do have nine, for, <laughs> nine uh, guests up here. I had to make sure my math was right, I apologize. <laughs> um, nine guests up here, so uh, does anyone have a question for anyone up here? None at all? All these Disney fans, <laughs> no one has a question. <laughs> Alright, all right, can, can everybody hear me? Yeah. Yes. Wow, so my voice is that loud. <laughs> um, I guess it's for all of you. Um, obviously, you have been at, at the studio for a long time and it's celebrating its 100th anniversary. What is your favorite Disney moment? And it could be from anything, from the mo live action movies, not not the live action <laughs> Disney movies. Yes, you can bring them. Some of them are good, some of them are not. And, uh, but who, all the movies and TV shows in general, like what is your all time favorite Disney moments out of the 100, 100 years? For me, I mean, I, I, I probably thought about it a little bit longer and come up with a different answer, but for me it was seeing The Little Mermaid done and in a theater and having the reaction it got, because up until that time we had done films, I started on Black Cauldron and Mickey's Christmas Carol, which was, you know, Mickey's Christmas Carol was well received, so Cauldron was not so well received, but working up to the, making The Little Mermaid was all, you know, it was good. But when that movie came out and seeing that in the theater with other people that paid to get in there and having them laugh at stuff that I did and, you know, because I did scuttle and all the funny stuff, and to have them laugh at my stuff, you know, uh, and then the reception it got when the film was over and everybody cheered and stuff. I mean, it was like an incredible moment. It was like, this is my dream. My dream has come true. It's like, this is exactly why I wanted to be an animator was to do something like this that people are going to respond as well to. And of course, it's still remembered very much today, as are, as are a lot of things that we all worked on. But it's really gratifying to, to be able to work really hard on something and then have that kind of love back. So to me, that was the first big Disney moment for me. Yeah, there's so many uh, moments over the years, it's almost impossible to put one above the others, but there are some that kind of jump out at me. Obviously seeing like a goofy movie in a theater with an actual audience, enjoying the work that you've done is a big thrill. Prince and the Popper, it's the first time I had one of my characters on the big screen, and that was a, a, a big thrill. Um, meeting people and finding out how much your work means to them many times, with, especially with a goofy movie, people say, you know, I couldn't talk to my dad, and uh, that became our movie, and we became closer because of that. Um, I, I, talking to kids in hospitals, I was fortunate enough in Florida once I got to meet Muhammad Ali. And so, I, of course, I was amazed to talk with him and everything, and uh, told him what I did, he was a big fan and all of that stuff. And then he said, do you ever talk to kids in hospitals? And I said, yeah, we do. Fam famous phone friends, Make-A-Wish Foundation, stuff like that. I said, man, then you're my hero, and shook my hand. I'll never forget that because these characters have more, they're, they're not just, it's not just a job. They're, there's power with these characters. We had a, uh, Wayne Allwine, who did Mickey Mouse, got a call from a mother whose daughter had uh, leukemia and was resisting treatment. And so he says, gosh, you know, when the Pluto gets sick, we give him his medicine and he feels a lot better. 
And just from that call, about three months later, got a, a letter from the lady who said that because of that, talking to Mickey, uh, her daughter, whole attitude changed and she went into remission of uh, the leukemia. So it's more than the sum of the parts. It's There's a power to this and realizing that there is more to it than just work, than just doing the lines is so important to me. And overall, I think that's what resonates with me. I would say the seminal moment in my life uh, that summed up my love of Disney was the first time I saw Mary Poppins in, in the theaters. That just did it for me. And then the year after that, seeing Jungle Book. And then a little knowing that several years later I would get to be Big Hero. But I just, I, those are, those are two of my favorite movies, but of course my absolute favorite is Snow White and the Seven Dwarves. And my good friend uh, Sleepy over here. <laughs> oh boy. Um, I think on repeat I had Bedknobs and Broomsticks, Robin Hood. Uh, those were some of my favorites. Um, my, I give a lot of credit to my late mother, who was just a creative bundle of joy. And she was an artist, she would draw, sketch, sculpt, and every day I would come home from school, there was something new for me to see. And she encouraged my silliness and uh, to be ridiculous with my voices. And uh, at one point, uh, she had been diagnosed with cancer, and that sparkle in her eye had dissipated, and she wasn't able to create. And it was a part of me that was, uh, there was a void that was left uh, when she was dealing with that. And so, when the good news came that I was going to be voicing Donald Duck, um, she taught me how to do that voice when I was three years old. And so I got to fly her out to California, take her to the studios, take her to where they make the cartoons and where they draw it all together, and that sparkle came back. And to me, that was a moment of true Disney magic because it had nothing to do necessarily with the characters, but the environment and what Walt created for the world. And so to be a tiny piece of that and to transfer that joy to other people, it's not about me, it's about the character that they love. And when they hear that voice uh, of that cantankerous quacker, that feisty fella, it just stirs such joy and I am grateful to be a part of it. He's gonna make me cry. <laughs> it didn't work. It's hard. <laughs> Well, I'm going to go very personal. The, the, the biggest moment of my life uh, of, of Disney was um, after I had been told that we were going to have a shoot on such and such a day and go to get your hair all done up, which I did, they did for Tinkerbell, and get into your one-piece bathing suit with your cover up. And now you're walking to stage one. And you know it's real. You 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 just know. Uh, all this is all all the fluff that's going on. So uh, <clears throat> I walk in, and uh, I think Mark Davis walked with me. We went into the, you know, what we were going to do and how we were going to do it. And then uh, I think I just told you the story when when he said when he said what he wanted to be, and he said Barbara, we wanted to be you. I mean, I sort of. I soared, that's the only word. So I, I could do that. So we were in the middle of doing this the first time and a whole group of people walked in. Uh, we had the door open, the huge door in the that let trucks in and out because I had no dialogue. I remember I was the silent one. And this group walked in and the buddy Emerson is leading the group. We couldn't mess him. And over at the side wall, there had been these risers that were sitting there that you could step up on, smaller ones, and then there were line drawings on the wall. There's a picture of it in my book if you ever get a chance to see that. And <clears throat> so these men are standing around, they're talking about it, they're trying this, they're trying that, and then they figure it out and they all go away except one man. And he comes over to see Mark Davis. And I think his name was Walter E. Disney. Well, I had been trained all of my life to never 
uh, if you saw a head of a studio, you curtsied and you ran around and hid because you never, that was no, 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 he had the, everything, he had, and here this man walks over to me and I'm, I'm looking at the head of the studio. I was not used to that. I was dumbfounded. I couldn't talk. He was so nice. He chatted with us. He was checking what Mark was doing and how the scene was going and what the props were. And he's good friends with the cameraman. And they chatted for a while. Jerry Geronimi, an Uber director for the movie, they were chatting. They kept trying to bring me into the conversation. I thought, <laughs> the whole time. And, uh, and then he left. And I thought, saw the head of a studio. Well, the third time that he came over after working on the wall, so, and why was he working on the wall and I was working on the main part of the sound stage? Because at that moment, Disney only had one sound stage. That was it. So <clears throat> the, uh, about the third time he came over and he walked up and said to me, I understand that you go to school with my daughters. And I was, uh, I, 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 I've never been caught without something to say in my life. <clears throat> and it was true. I went to a girls' school because I could get permit to get out and work. You couldn't do this at a, a public school. And I said, yes, it, uh, they were there. One was in the upper grade, a lower grade. And then I'm, I'm still dumbfounded. And he stepped away. <clears throat> Excuse me, I made fun. <clears throat> and he said, I think they must have liked you. Or something like that that was so uh -huh. <laughs> But and he, he came over another time. But I realized, I got to know then, that this man, you could walk up to him any time, you could talk to him any time, and all the rules that were all of the other uh, studios, which were, I mean, they were heavy laden rules. Uh, it didn't happen at Disney. Everybody talked. Everybody smiled. Everybody take you wherever if you were lost. It was a tiny place. And the, but that one time, the first time he, he came over and talked, and he was slim and trim, and I thought, oh, the head of the studio looks like that. <laughs> and then the third time, the head of the studio looks like Walt Disney. Oh. Oh, he is Walt Disney. <laughs> so that's the time that stands out in my mind. See, the first thing that comes to my mind. Um, so when I was recording for Boo, I wasn't in. Or I wasn't in the studio with Billy Crystal or John Goodman or the other actors. So I never met them until when I was five. Is when in two thousand one is when the movie came out. And so at this point, I've seen the movie. So I I, I knew the voices. Um, but it was the premiere, and I, it was like, I was walking down the red carpet, I was, you know, five years old, you know, I had no idea what I was doing, and, and still, at this point, I hadn't met any of the other actors, um, but Billy Crystal came up behind me and said, boo, in his, Mike, in, his, in his Mike Wazowski voice, and I apparently, I turned around, and I just go, Mike Wazowski, and then, you know, all the nerves, like, just went away, and Billy Crystal walked me down the red carpet, and being two and a half, I don't remember much of the recording, but I do remember more of, like, of that, and, you know, I was just learned how to write my name, and I was like signing autographs for my first time. So that's why I did like my first like, even though that was before Disney bought Pixar. I guess my one of my earliest you know memories of being in, in that whole world. Um, but just uh, just to echo what a couple uh, people said up there, um, just a really special part is like is going to these cons really and like reali realizing how much the every really every Disney and Pixar movie, but seeing how much these movies affect people. I have people that come up to my booth and. You know, I was, I was two and a half, it was such a small role in my mind, but how much it affected, just the movie in general, how it affected people, you know, the people that say they have, they're going through a hard time in their life and they watched it every night just to help fall asleep. I don't know, just the little things like that to realize, like, how much of an impact your part has made on someone's life is just kind of, it's just like a special feeling that's just kind of like warms my inside. I don't know, makes me feel all good and fuzzy inside. So, yeah, it's just an honor to be a part of that. You see a theme forming, right? Like everybody, you know, who plays a part in something like this, you know that it's so much bigger than just you. You know, these these personal experiences that people have with something that you had a small part in making. You know, it's so very special. Um, and I, 
I'm, I'm spoiled because my favorite moment in Disney history is literally Peter Pan fighting Captain Hook. It was my favorite thing. It was all I wanted to watch. I loved it. I loved it. And the fact that I get to play in that sandbox at all is so cool to me. But uh, the thing that really stands out is when we first started the movie, we did like a proper read through. And um, I sat there with some other actors and it was amazing. It was really cool. And it just felt like, wow, I'm Peter Pan. This is awesome. And then very quickly afterwards, they basically replaced everybody but me and Captain Hook. And I was like, okay, no way am I gonna be in this movie. Like, I'm absolutely sure they're gonna replace me with Michael J. Fox at some point. And, you know, I, so I'm just gonna ride it. I'm just gonna ride and have fun and, you know, doing my other things, writing screenplays and doing film festivals and doing all this other stuff and then being like, oh, I get to go uh, swashbuckle today. I get to go fly, I get to, you know, um, be, Peter Pan. Uh, so uh, my moment that really stands out to me is I was back home and it, this went on for two or three years of you know making the film and rewriting. It's gonna go straight to video. No, it's not. It's gonna go to theater. So we have to change everything. So it just kept going. And again, the whole time I'm like, no way am I in this movie. But I love that I get to go in. And I was back home in Bossier City, Louisiana at the mall theater. And I went in to watch a movie with some friends while I was home for the holidays. And the trailer came out. And it was me. And I'm like, whoa, okay, it's real now. You know, and it was uh, just this great moment. And uh, every time I get to go back and do it, I just feel so lucky. Yeah. So growing up in Alaska, we had, you know, our three channels and, and PBS, you know, four channels. And every Sunday, my family would watch, you know, every Sunday night. Walt Disney special of the week, right? And so that that the castle with Tinkerbell and and um, and, and it, that was just so much a part of my you know very um, very happy family time that I had. And so you know then all of a sudden I'm there at in Central Park with 110,000 people and Disney. Um, flew my two brothers, my two little brothers, um, in to, uh, to, to, as a surprise. To, they showed up at my, at my, on my front stoop and they got to ride in the police motorcade that got us to, you know, to the premiere. And, and it was just this kind of full circle where I had not seen, I'd seen the rough cut, you know, and a lot of it was still in storyboard at that point. So this was my first time getting to see it, you know, three and a half stories high, or three and a half box cars, you know, welded together with four different sound systems and, and getting to meet all of the other actors, with the exception of Mel Gibson, who I still have not yet met, who played John Smith, <laughs> the entire romance with him and, what? Where is he? <laughs> no. But, um, you know, to, to kind of have, go through that and then full circle to then Ralph Breaks the Internet and to be on stage with all of the other Disney princesses. And, you know, we all got to introduce each other. I got to introduce Sydney and Noni Rose. And, you know, as we, you know, went from one, when Disney Princess to the next, who was introducing the next, and John Lasseter was out there, and, and it was just, you know, by the end, it was D23, we were making the announcement that all the Disney Princesses were in Ralph Breaks the Internet, and I realized, we're bigger than the Beatles. <laughs> <laughs> so, there's that moment, and, and you know, and then now here, getting to see with boo, boo. <laughs> The talent here is just really amazing. So there's so many moments that I, mean, I could go on forever. Well, <laughs> I'm going to talk about being an audience member and watching Fantasia for the first time when I was young. And that changed my whole outlook of what a cartoon was and what a cartoon could be. And that's the movie that inspired me 
because it was so clever and so beautiful and they did so many interesting things in that movie and that's what made me really, really appreciate Disney. Although I love Bambi and Snow White and everything else because why not? But um, that movie to me was groundbreaking and I loved it. I took my kids, they had a special showing at the Grauman's Chinese and I took my kids to see it because I thought it was important to see cartoons done in a different way. And that's me. <laughs> All right, I think we have time for one more question. Yes. So, I mean, I know you all, I know it's hard. So, I mean, I know you all already said what your favorite Disney moments and memories are, but what do you all personally feel that the legacy of Disney and the way back Say the, the ending part one more time. What, what do you all feel is the legacy of Disney and voice actors and actresses at Disney? Ooh. Well, I'm not a voice actor, so I'll answer it a different way. To me, the thing we should never lose sight of is it was started by a guy named Walt Disney, and I think a lot of that's the things that are happening today are kind of not Walt Disney. You know, they're kind of coming from a different place, but as a kid growing up and seeing Walt Disney every single Sunday night and thinking, thinking of him as like an uncle, like a relative, I think was really special to a lot of us growing up who wanted to be Disney animators. So to me, I think the most important thing is to remember, remember Walt and what he stood for. And I think Disney needs to carry that on. It's very important that we keep, keep that in mind. You know that was that Walt started it, and he can never he should never be forgotten. Yeah, I, I'd second that. I think uh, obviously Walt started something that was very popular. I mean, Mickey was the first talking character back in like 1928, and it's still on television every day. That says something about longevity, about doing it right the first time, and uh, with all of the newer projects that they're doing, they're they're batting pretty well, and. I think, but it's the legacy. It really is the legacy that Walt left, and uh, of those characters that have stood the test of time, that uh, people love and just become a part of your life, really. I think the legacy of voice actors is going to be presented in a very good light next Sunday night on ABC with Once Upon a Studio. <laughs> Simply because there are there is archival footage of voice actors, you know, that are used in it, and then there are people that are still doing the same voice that they created through other films, and then people like me, I got the honor of being Cox with. It, the voice acting will always go on. If there is somebody that can do these voices, Daniel can do Donald Duck, Bill can imitate Pinto Kovic and do a great Goofy. I've done a few of those myself, but this is one of the singular greatest honors of my life, getting to the top of it. I think um, when it comes to Walt, there is no such thing as a fountain of youth, but as it relates to immortality, to anchor yourself in the hearts and imagination of people for generations is as close to immortality as you can possibly get. And I often say that cartoon characters are venerated echoes of our past and custodians of our childhood and our joy that we sometimes forget about later in life. They're always there waiting to greet you in the same way Every time you want to revisit that inner child, they are there. They're there for you. And so mirroring what Bob just said about, and feeling that emotion about being attached to a character who inspires so much joy and, and so much amazing things and feelings throughout the world, to be a small part of that and to have that be our legacy as a voice actor, 
I think there's nothing greater in the world. We can do all the work we want, but it's not about us, it's about the characters that people love and what resonates with them. And so gratitude is really where we come from. Well, I'm going to build on just what you said. It made you cry. I'll make you cry while I'm telling the story. <laughs> because uh, this is a, just a short a story. <clears throat> Oh, oh, Mama. There we go. Uh, this is a story that tells you how far all of the things that, that they have done uh, have reached out into the world. I was doing a show, oh, I would say, uh, around uh, 20 years ago, and this woman came up to me, and she was shaking, and she was crying. And I thought, oh, what have I got here? I, I don't know. And she finally reached out and took my hand. Now this is a young lady, I would say 37 years old, very trim, looking nice. And she said, I never thought that I could say thank you to the uh, character that saved my life. Now this is one of three that's happened. And I said, what? And I figured by that time, you know, call the guards. <laughs> But no, she had her 12-year-old daughter with her who showed this picture of her when she weighed almost 300 pounds. She had had both knees operated on, I forgot, so she was in a wheelchair. She had given up. She really had, she said. And, uh, but she thought, who thinks happy thoughts? And she thought, take her back. I have loved her all my life. So she had Tinkerbell tattooed on her leg. And every time that she thought an unhappy thought, she would look at her leg and say, no, happy thoughts. And her daughter said, that is what brought her through that terrible time. And I'm boy, I wonder if, if Disney has any idea of what his power to touch people all around the world. In fact, I, I was so impressed that we took pictures of it. It's in my book, and, it's, and she's only one of three who has told me that Tinkerbell saved their lives. Uh, you can't get much better than that. So that's my story about what I feel about how Disney reaches out to people in different ways and good ways. what Margaret was saying, it's just, um, Disney movies especially, I mean, they're just full of so much joy and hope, and there's always a happy ending, you know, and I think, like, that's important to hold on to in, like, this world that, you know, we've all been through, we all know the craziness that's in the world and that, you know, in our lives, and, and Susie and I get, you know, get, get in our heads or get down, and to have something that we could put on and just, like, be inspired and, and get that imagination flowing and something to connect to and to, you know, Everyone that makes a part, like the, everyone that's a part of it, whether you know it's actor, or director, or the artist, and just you know, I think it's just um, you know that's the legacy. It's like just just giving people hope and inspiration, and that's just it's a beautiful thing. So thank, thanks, Walt. <laughs> uh, yeah, I second everything that said about the legacy. Obviously, that is uh, very important to everybody that's up on the stage. But I just wanted to touch real quick on the voiceover artist. You know. Uh, I love actors. Uh, I just, I really do. I direct a lot. Uh, when I write, I'm writing for actors in my brain that I just think are wonderful and I just can't wait to watch what they do with this stuff. And voiceover actors are a very special group of people. I mean, I know this sounds like a strange thing to say, but they're incredibly brave and not self-conscious and willing to go there in the most silly way it's humanly possible. Uh, in order to accomplish this thing, and for you know people on this stage to accomplish the thing for the iconic character that you know, right? They're giving it all so that it's the same character that you grew up with, you know, and that they go there to that place. And I just admire it so much. There's no self-consciousness, right? Because what they're doing, what they're portraying, is so important, and uh, you know they're iconic because of that. Well, I, I know that when I 
first was offered this role, that was the first thing that came through my mind was, you know, again, that time of being with family and that legacy that it had kind of brought to me of a, a, a warmth and a comfort and joy and a feeling like, you know, there's, there's good in humankind <laughs> and humans can be kind and all of those things that I think that um, really, a, a, that Walt that was able to shine a light on, on as us as humans and storytellers. And I just think that, you know, when I, when I, when I took this role, I understood that it was part of a legacy, a great legacy that, you know, you could only hope that you might be able to live up to in some way, shape, or form. And, and, the, and as far as like voice acting and that, um, it, you know, basically we're just a bunch of big kids. We, it's all about your imagination and you get to just live in that space of between, you know, this world and the next and, and, and the, any world you could imagine, you know, and, and that, that spark of imagination and creativity is really the true legacy, I think, that Walt Disney was able to give, you know, generations. Still does. Well, I think Walt knew a good story. And I hope that they continue with the good stories. And I'll use my movie as an example. Uh, Sleeping Beauty almost broke the bank. And they were looking at going bankrupt. And they didn't know what they were going to do. Well, Xerox went to Roy Disney and said, we've got a new way of animation. We'll show you. It's with the Xerox copier. Mm -hmm. And so Roy went to Walt and said, I don't know, Xerox has this new way of doing animation. And they gave them, you know, all of the instructions as to how to do it. And Walt said, okay, okay, let's do it. And then they said, well, what about a story? And he said, and he was on top of his game. He said, I have one. And it was 101 Dalmatians. And he went to England to get Dodie Smith to sign off on it. And she strung him along. And he was determined. He was getting that story. And she kept saying, well, I'll sign the contract, but you have to do this for me. And he'd say, OK. And they planned to meet. And she'd say, well, I don't know. But she'd have a British accent, not speak like I do. And so she'd say, I, there's something else I might need. She strung him along for a long time. And he hung in there. He got her to Hollywood. He got it signed. He got it done. And that movie saved his studio. So I think he was very brilliant at the good story. And we all love the good story. The last thing I just want to leave all of you guys with, um, briefly related to the legacy of Disney um, and just appreciation for everything that you guys do and have done for Disney and fans and from all of us. Um, I was a character host at Disneyland for about four years. I just recently transitioned. Um, my favorite thing about being a character host was engaging in the stories with the characters, the stories that you guys have all helped create. Seeing the faces of these little kids that they have absolutely no idea who I am, but as soon as they see Mickey Mouse, as soon as they see Goofy, as soon as they see Peter Pan at the parks, they're running up and they're calling their name, they're running with their arms wide open, they're, they're engaging in them with the story, they're engaging in that character story and that life because that has a meaning to them with whatever happened in their life at the time of seeing that story. And I may not have been a part of the film, but I, get to, I got to live that with those kids in the parks, with the characters that you guys helped create and tell their stories. So I'm sure a lot of these front guys here have also been in the parks and have met those characters and have also shared in that um, with remembering 
their childhood and those magic memories from the movies and, and characters that you guys helped tell. So um, thank you again for that. Thank you for being a part of that legacy. I'm sure this comes from everyone um, and anyone here out from here on out in the future that you know these characters are going to continue to live on in whatever story is is chosen to be be told with them. So thank you once again and thank you everyone for coming to the panel. Thank and so I'll much. give a big round of applause for our uh, Disney guests here. Thank you everyone for attending today.